Hello, good afternoon. My name is Jay Tower, and uh, if you're in the right room here today, you are here to see me talking about Remote Work Extreme Edition. Uh, how many, just by a show of hands, how many people are already remote workers, at least, you know, a day a week, half a day a week, or more? Okay, so it looks like about a little over half of us. Great. So uh, if you guys have any questions about how to work remote or remotely successfully, ask those people who just raised their hands afterwards. Um, and then uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, the Extreme Edition part is, is about my trip around the country with my family while I worked remotely in sort of a, an extreme situation. So again, my name is Jay Tower. It says Jonathan on my birth certificate, and then my parents immediately started calling me Jay. I'm not sure why that happened, but you'll have to ask them about that. I work for a company that I started January 1st of this year uh, as a principal consultant and partner called Trailhead Technology Partners. We're a custom software development shop. Uh, if you're looking for any help with that, <clears throat> I'd be interested in talking to you afterwards. I usually do the technical talks. I'm a Microsoft MVP in ASP.NET, and uh, I'm a Telerik developer expert and uh, interested in a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, other technologies. So um, this is kind of a new thing for me, doing a non-technical talk. So if it feels weird for you, it, just know that it feels weird for me, too, to be at a non-technical talk right now. Uh, you can find me online, also. Uh, if you don't want to come up and talk afterwards, uh, you can find me in these places. And I'm also, uh, I've got the slides from this up on GitHub. If you want to tantalize yourself with these pictures, again, afterwards. Uh, also wanted to mention uh, this picture of me here from Glacier National Park. Uh, all of the, talk, the rest of the talk here, I've got pictures of my, of my family and I and our experience over this year trip that we took, and I've tried to label all of them where they came from, in case you're curious, uh, but I may not address that throughout the talk. So uh, just to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today, uh, I'm going to talk about working remotely in general. I've been doing it for quite a few years now. Uh, with to you know greater and lesser success, and I've learned a lot of lessons from that. Also, going to talk about my four, uh, what we call our 48 states project, going around the country in one year. I'll talk a little bit about the trip logistics and how that worked. Kind of answer some of the frequently asked questions that we get about that, as well as talking about how working remotely worked there and some of the lessons that that we learned from that. Uh, finally. Uh, if there's time, I'll be happy to answer questions either during our time slot here or afterwards. And of course, uh, I've got lots of pictures in here, so uh, hope you enjoy that. Uh, but first, one thing I like to do at all my talks is uh, I do this as a way to give back to the community. There's been a lot of people that have fed into my career over the years. I'm sure you feel the same way. So one of the ways that I try and sort of pay it forward is to come out in the community and do some of these talks about things that I've been learning, uh, hopefully to be helpful for people. So if you find anything helpful or useful today and you want to pay it forward, feel free to go to this bit.ly link here. Uh, this is for Charity Water, which is a great charity that I support that helps bring clean water to places where it doesn't exist yet. Uh, I normally, I have a, uh, a little, um, like thermometer bar, progress bar up here in the corner. It's kind of off the screen here today, so you won't be able to see it. But uh, if you guys donate, uh, I have that updating during the, during the talk today, so I'll actually be able to tell you um, where our progress is. If you guys hit, and I'm, I'm, I actually wanted to change that to $75 for you guys, so I set up a $75 campaign. I think with, we got over 80 people in this room, we could probably do that. Uh, but if you give $75, I'll match that today as well. So just to uh, get us started, talking about working remotely in general. So you know, what makes a good remote worker? Number one on the list is probably communication. Has to be, right? If you ask uh, you know, what makes a successful marriage or relationship, that's always number one on that list. So I guess we'll put it number one on our list, too. Uh, but it's different a little bit than it is in a, in a more romantic type relationship. If you're working remotely, you're not going to bump into your coworkers you know, on the way to the coffee machine or the, the Keurig or the water cooler or whatever uh, to have them say, hey, did you get my email and did you understand that? Uh, or for you to ask them that question. So it's good to be thinking about being very proactive. And I know there's probably a lot of software developers, a lot of engineer types in the room. That's my background as well. And you know, we're not known for being the most outgoing, social, charismatic uh, 
type, right? Uh, more heads down and uh, don't bother me while I'm coding and uh, drinking Mountain Dew and slide a pizza under the door once in a while types, right? So communication's important. Uh, if you work remotely now, you've probably run into that problem where you've realized that there's sort of a hierarchy of communication where uh, phone calls or you know, physical visits are maybe at the top of that pyramid and then phone calls and, and then you know, email and, and that is way down at the bottom at the, the very lowest form of you know, snail type communication because that's where all the miscommunication and misunderstandings and things come from. Uh, knowing how you work is another important thing if you're gonna be a successful remote worker. The day I started working remotely from home, I invested a fair amount in uh, one of those Aeron chairs. Everybody know what those are? The ones that were cool in 1995. So it, this was like 2006, so I was cool just about 11 years late, which is pretty typical. Um, but the reason I got that chair, those chairs are relatively expensive, but the reason I got it is I know I'm gonna be spending a lot of time here. This is how I make my money. Uh, so you know, if I made money roofing, I would probably, uh, I'd probably buy some good equipment for that. So I bought good equipment for where my money comes from. Eliminating distractions. This is uh, one I think a lot of people are worried about if they haven't worked remotely before, the first time they start working remotely. Uh, you know, if you're working from home, is your TV or your Xbox or whatever going to be too tempting? And you know, maybe that is the case for you. Uh, that usually is not the case for me, but uh, what I try and do is just set limits on those types of things for myself. So maybe Xbox is out of the question Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, one of the things I like to do is when I'm at home, I feel like there's a lot of you know, little cleanup type jobs that are always needing to be done, uh, emptying the dishwasher or whatever. I always try and limit myself to just one of those during work hours so that I don't kind of get caught up and maybe try and avoid a, a more sticky problem that I have at the office that I'm uh, you know, purposely avoiding with something a little easier, like unloading dishwashers. Thinking about uh, the people that you live with is another important thing. These kind of become your office mates in a way now, although uh, maybe even uh, less helpful than your in the actual office office mates as far as productivity goes. Uh, they're not at least pretending to try and help you be productive, productive right? Uh, so like when I started working remotely, uh, one of the things I did was set an alarm on my phone immediately uh, before my kids would get off the bus and come home from school. Uh, anybody that's got kids knows that kids only come with two volume levels off and, and fully on 100%, right? So they'd come in the door and making all the noise that kids make and uh, I'd be on a meeting with a client or something and I'd have to shut the door to the office and once that, I set that alarm, that problem was solved. I would just close the door ahead of time. Um, next is uh, getting out and seeing humans. This is such a huge one. I was just talking with a friend about this uh, who worked remotely with me for a company for a couple of years. And he was saying that this is one of the things that really was difficult about it for him. Uh, just the immediate, uh, like, turning off the switch, going from being a social creature at the office to not having that at all. And... Uh, that is definitely a problem, especially, I think, for people like engineers that maybe tend to that end of the spectrum where we automatically aren't that way anyway. So one of the things I did to combat this was uh, I got a membership to one of these co-working facilities. Is everybody kind of familiar with those? Um, and uh, what that kind of forced me to do is get out a few days a week at least uh, because I'm kind of a cheap guy, so I'm paying for this thing, so I'm darn well going to use it, right? And so now I'm forced to get out and there's all these people that I meet and I get this new community, people I can go to lunch with, uh, even though they're not the people that I'm working with on the projects that I'm on, it's, it helps you know, scratch that, that social need that we all have. Uh, getting involved in some form of community, this is about the time that I started working remotely, is about the time I started getting involved in organizing events. Uh, I'm from Grand Rapids and I organize uh, some events up there called Grand Rapids Dev Day and Dev Night. Perhaps you've heard of it or uh, seen other people talking about it. Um, and started speaking in the community at that time as a way to give back just because when you're not in the office, you know, you gotta look for those opportunities to be social. Um, and then the, the last one is uh, if you find an answer to this, finding a way to separate work and personal life, if you find that answer, please let me know because uh, I don't think anybody's figured this out yet. You can make millions of dollars if you write that book. Uh, but it may sound simple, but what I kind of figured out over the years is that the only way for me that worked was to set time, 
limits. So unless something is actually on fire or you know, a production system is actually down, uh, not somebody's interpretation of a production system being down like uh, you, know, you haven't responded to my email in 15 minutes, but an actual problem, uh, I try not to work outside of work hours. It's a lot harder when uh, everything around you visually is the same when you're working as it is when you're spending time with your loved ones. And uh, so it actually, uh, I think because of the bent in America towards workaholism and things, uh, I think maybe even more so in the Midwest, that uh, that is probably more of a risk than it going the other way where you're playing Xbox all day, although I certainly know people who would do that. <laughs> Uh, so just a briefly about my working from home story, I've been working remotely for seven years for three different companies. Um, originally, actually got an offer to work for a consulting company in California. I live in Michigan, and uh, that's a whole other story I could tell you if you're interested some other time. But uh, basically, uh, I flew out there, loved the company, loved the people, just felt really nervous about working in general. And... Uh, I think looking back at it, what, what happened is I had done a little moonlighting before, and I associated that phase of moonlighting with working from home. Uh, that particular time uh, in my life was really busy. I was, my, my nine to five job was not staying very well between nine and five. It was like 50 hours a week already. And then I was trying to find 10 or, I'm sorry? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, sound carries really well in here. That's great, right? I don't even need this thing. Um, so, uh, you know, I was trying to find 10 or 20 other hours a week to uh, work on this, on this other project, moonlighting project, and I think I associated the stress of that with working remotely. So I ended up turning down the job. I was just saying, hey, you know, I'm waiting until something really great comes along. Uh, fortunately, uh, my no was not accepted. My boss at the time actually uh, forced me, <laughs> sort of. He, uh, he answered all my questions and uh, changed a few things about the offer to make it work even better for me. So I gave it a try, and I'm so thankful I did. Uh, but once I started doing it, what I learned is that uh, while I would say now that I, it would be very difficult for me to ever go back to 9 to 5 in an office, uh, that it is a double-edged sword. There's good and bad things about working remotely. Those of you who raised your hands earlier can probably attest to that. Uh, hopefully, uh, is there anybody by a show of hands that's working remotely 100%? Uh, nobody, okay. So uh, either that or you don't want to admit it because you're afraid I'll pick on you. Um, well, in any case, it, there's definitely a difference between working 50% from home and working 100% from home. And some of the negatives you start to notice a little bit more when you get into that 100% level. So let me talk a little bit about our trip. And that really took my remote working into an extreme place. Uh, we call it the 48 States Project because we lived in an RV for a year and went to the contiguous 48 states during that uh, 13 and a half month time frame. We blogged about it here if you're interested in learning more. Uh, so the first question, the most common question we always get <clears throat> is where did you get this idea? <clears throat> uh, usually in between the lines in the question or in someone's eyes when they're asking it, you can read there's an implied comma crazy exclamation point at the end, right? Uh, this is outside the box. I know probably half of you are thinking, wow, that sounds awesome, and the other half of you right now are thinking that sounds awful. Uh, so I think that's a, common, that's a common reaction. Like a lot of things in life, though, there wasn't just you know, a, a beam of light from heaven that came down and said, go this way. Uh, there was a number of things that kind of led up to it. So looking back at it, what we've decided is some of the things that contributed to it is my wife and I are big fans of national parks. We've when we visit somewhere, we always try and visit a national park in the area if we can. Love exploring new places. When we uh, do our vacations together, we'll often go to a new city we haven't been to before and just explore together for a long weekend or a week. Uh, I've got a group of guys from college that uh, we intend to go on a backcountry camping trip every year, so it ends up being every three years instead, right? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we realize, whenever we're planning that, we get this longer and longer backlog of places that we'd like to go. And uh, I'm starting to add up all of the two or three weeks of vacations over the years of my life and realizing I'm never going to make it to all these places. And then you uh, 
add that to an experience I had with a friend who was uh, in an apartment in Chicago and moving to a different apartment, asked for some help, you know, carrying couches and stuff. We're about three hours away from there in Grand Rapids. So I offered to come over and help for the weekend. After I offered, he said, uh, okay, but we're going to do most of the work Friday, right after, you know, right about 5 o'clock. So, okay, well, I already agreed, so I'm going to just go, and on Thursday night, I'll go stay with a friend. I'll work from there. I work remotely anyway, right? I'll work from Chicago on Friday at 4.30 or whatever. We'll kick off, and we'll go straight over to my buddy's house and help him move. So uh, we did this, and uh, after this day of doing that, I realized, like, I've been doing this for a few years, working remotely, and I have only done this once, where I went and worked remotely from a different place. It really doesn't matter where the where is. And it got me kind of thinking. So uh, a couple of years pass, and uh, I've got this user group that I help run at the time in Grand Rapids. And one of the other organizers has lined up a speaker. The topic is tech nomadism. And I think to myself, well, that's weird. I've never heard that word before. Uh, this will be interesting to check out. So uh, it turns out this guy has uh, tech nomadism is, taking, is using technology to enable a nomadic lifestyle. And this guy had taken his family on the road, uh, sold their house permanently, and they just lived in an RV, and that's what they did. And he was a software guy. Uh, that's where he made his money. I thought, uh, that's pretty fascinating, right? You don't hear that very often. So when I got home, I mentioned to my wife, hey, this interesting guy tonight um, you know, came and talked to the group. This is what he did with his family. End of the conversation. Except until the next morning when I'm getting ready for work, my wife comes into the bathroom and says, I can't stop thinking about that guy you were talking about last night, and I can't help but think that we should do that. Now, let me back you up, since probably most of you do not know my wife um, personally, but that is not her job in the relationship. That's my job to say stuff like that. Uh, anybody in a relationship probably is, knows who in the relationship, whether you're the uh, let's keep everything the same person, or if you're the let's change everything up all the time person, right? There's usually one of each in a relationship. My job is to say, let's change things. They've been, you know, the couch has been in the same place for three months. I'm getting sick of it. And her job is to, you know, steady as she goes. So uh, obviously, after I picked my jaw up off the floor, I said, let's, uh, you know, let's continue talking about this after work. So we did. And what we basically decided was to keep moving forward with plans until we ran into some sort of a roadblock that prevented plans from going forward. And then we would know. It wasn't meant to happen, and we could go on with our lives as, as previously planned, right? Well, guess what? We never ran into a roadblock. <laughs> so the planning phase lasted about two years, and uh, during that two-year time, there was a lot of things to think about, including, maybe most importantly, uh, money, <laughs> right? Uh, this is not going to be a cheap thing to do. Uh, so one of the first things was, well, obviously, I'm going to have to keep working because we're not independently wealthy. So uh, my wife worked at the time. She's a nurse. She worked at a doctor's office a couple days a week. It was a pretty easy, laid-back type of a job. She could pretty much leave at the end of the day and leave work there. Uh, it, didn't take, it didn't ask a lot out of her, you know, the type of job I'm talking about. Uh, it also didn't pay very well, so, you know, that usually goes hand in hand. And uh, because of that, she looked for a new job. Uh, she started working a lot more hours. And all that money we started saving away for two years. The closer we got to the trip, because I was a, a remote software consultant, I spent you know, probably five or six hours on uh, online meetings and phone calls and things like that uh, during the day. So I started obsessing the closer we got about internet and how can I make sure, guarantee that internet's going to be good, right? Uh, anybody have bad internet in here right now? Yeah, so you cannot guarantee that internet's going to be good everywhere, right? because uh, we're definitely in civilization right now. Uh, but we went a lot of places where civilization was a little, a little, uh, a little uh, more you know, far away. So um, I started looking into options. I'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. We thought about, well, you know, do we keep the house or sell the house? And in the end, decided to, to become landlords and rent it out for a year. Hired a management company to manage that for us because, hey, if I'm in South Dakota, and a pipe breaks in the basement at 2 AM. I don't want to have to worry about that or have to come back and solve that. That was worth 9%, which is what they charged us. 
Uh, we also thought about, um, we started having to think about RVs for the first time in our lives. Uh, I was telling the gentleman up here who's helping us out with sound today, thank you by the way. Um, I told him earlier that uh, we're sort of tent campers before that. We, you know, I do those backcountry trips with friends and uh, really more into the unplugged style of camping up until this point. I had used my grandparents' motorhome a few summers for a couple weeks here and there when I was really young uh, in the early 80s. Anybody remember those Coachman motorhomes with the bed over the, the cab, the classics, right? Uh, has anyone seen one of those recently and noticed how much smaller they are than the ones that they have now? You could fit one of those in like the cupboard of an RV today. Uh, anyway, so you know, it turns out RVs have changed quite a bit in 30 years, and uh, so I had, we had a lot to learn. We went to this RV dealer, the very first RV shopping experience we had. We went to this dealer, said, hey, we've been looking at this model online. We think we'd like to get this. Uh, can you show it to us? It was a travel trailer. Uh, if you're not familiar with RVs and the different types, a travel trailer is sort of a smaller towable trailer, would hitch on a, on a uh, ball hitch behind a vehicle, so you could tow it with like a you know, Ford Explorer or something like that, a little smaller than a pickup truck. And you know, we're thinking, well, we're just going to do this for a year. We're not going to go hog wild and buy the most expensive thing out there. He says with a picture of his really expensive thing behind the words. Uh, so we looked, so we walk into this travel trailer. It's probably like 200 square feet. The ceiling is like right here for me. I think my wife and I both started holding our breath at this moment, thinking, well, what did we get ourselves into? Uh, I guess we could make this work, but it's going to be really difficult. He must have read the look on our face because as we walked out of that RV, he said, you know, if you're going to live in this full time, you're really going to want to look at fifth wheels. Let me show you one. Upsale, right? Smart. So this is a fifth wheel, if you're not familiar with RVs. The, it's, they're taller, they're bigger, they're heavier, and they hitch up in the back of the bed of a pickup truck, more like a uh, semi-tractor trailer type of a setup. The reason is because they're so big and heavy, uh, it's a lot more stable for towing than it is on a ball hitch way down low. Uh, so we walk into this fir our first ever fifth wheel, and immediately we let that, that breath out that we had both been holding and said, okay, yes, we could live in here. The ceiling I can barely reach, and it feels twice as big. There's actually storage. So it totally changed our plans, as life will do on you sometimes, and uh, like tripled our budget for RV. But uh, at that point, we had to start truck shopping too, which also was kind of funny for my friends. I, at this point, sold my hybrid. <laughs> yeah, you guys understand. Uh, which got about 45 to 50 miles per gallon. Not bad, right? And I bought this little beauty here. And that got between 9 and 14. So pretty good, you know. If it was any less, it would be, instead of miles per gallon, it would be gallons per mile, right? Uh, when we towed the RV, it was about 9. So, uh, you know, much different. Uh, you can actually see the running boards on here. We actually had to have that installed. That wasn't factory. We had to have those installed because my little eight-year-old daughter couldn't get in. <laughs> I had to actually like lift her up to get her in. So you know, a lot of learning, a lot of learning during this two years. Really glad we took that time to plan it. We also started talking about what our hook was going to be. Uh, what makes this unique? We know people who work remotely. We know people who've traveled a lot. We know people who live in an RV. A lot of probably grandparents or. Uh, retired parents that you guys know are in that like snowbird type of a situation. So what's interesting or unique about our story? And I think I said, well, what if we try and go to all the 48 contiguous states all in, in one year? So that became our story, which meant we had to plan the route as well. Now this route I could really nerd out on for probably a whole hour all by itself, but I will spare you from that. Uh, so if you can see the, the blue and the red lines here that go around the country, so here's Grand Rapids where we live. So the blue line is the planned route, and we started going this way and finished coming back in this way through, you know, state number, uh, state number 48 for us was Ohio. So, you know, number 48, depending on how you look at that, that's either the best or the worst, right? Uh, I'm from Michigan, so I'm supposed to say it's the worst, though. You guys know that rule, right? So um, 
anyway, as you can see, as we went along here, it starts to vary a little bit. The red line, which is our actual route, starts to vary a little bit until uh, you know, we start to get out over here, and it starts to vary kind of a lot more wildly, in fact. And you know, there's a reason for that, and that is that uh, we planned the trip in about three month stints. So when we left, we knew it was summertime. We knew there was going to be some competition for some of these great RV parks at you know, national park sites and things along here. And there's going to be a lot of people with kids out of school also traveling and trying to get these spots. So we made a three months of reservations before we left, which meant that we kind of had to follow the program at that point, right? There wasn't a lot of wiggle room there. And then if you look at like this right here, here's another situation that actually led to a change during the trip. Um, this is, uh, my wife has some family in Topeka. And so we were up here in northern Missouri uh, for Fourth of July weekend. She said, hey, let's go see my family in Topeka. Now, if you can see our plan, uh, it was like six months later that we planned to finally just barely visit Kansas here. And so at that point, we had kind of checked it off the list. And the question was, well, do we still want to keep this whole route right here so far north just so that we can go through there? Uh, so anyway, when I was planning this route, like you do, you know, I searched Google for uh, minimum distance route between, uh, that hits all 48 states. And uh, believe it or not, I found a computer science graduate student who had done this as his like, capstone project for his degree. And uh, it, I know about half of you or any of you who have a computer science degree are already thinking about the traveling salesman problem, right? I see the smiles out there. I know who, I know who my people are now. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a classic computer science problem solving, uh, trying to help a, a salesman find the minimum distance between a number of points. It's a difficult type of problem to solve because every time you add a point, you have to calculate the distance between that point and every other point. Uh, and so that, for, for my nerd buddies out there, that's an NP complete, right? That's bad. That's a bad algorithm. Uh, so this guy had kind of ratcheted it up a little bit and said, well, what about, instead of points, what about three-dimensional shapes? And instead of straight lines, what about r the routes, the roads that exist already between all these different states? And so he had solved it. It was, uh, I want to say it was about 7,500 miles or something like that. That would hit 48 states. Pretty impressive. Um, I believe this route ended up the blue one here for us ended up being more a little over 9,000. So we definitely added to it. But there were some efficiencies in his algorithm that really would have made life not that much fun. For example, uh, instead of coming out to the west coast over here, uh, obviously there's no reason to travel this distance when you can hit all three of these states by coming just down the inside of them. Um, so we weren't going to go drive around the whole country and not even see the Pacific Ocean, right? Uh, we were also not going to you know, skip some of the big national parks, Yellowstone and Glacier and Yosemite and things like that. We also wanted to see friends and family that we knew around the country. Uh, so we started tweaking this route, and that's how it ended up changing. Some other logistics. Big question, one of the number one questions that we get after uh, what gave you this crazy idea is uh, what would you do for school for the kids? So my wife, as I mentioned before, she's a nurse professionally, but uh, she took the year off very kindly from her career to, uh, to homeschool the kids. And uh, as she did that, we kind of discovered uh, she's the kind of person who likes to research something. The first time she you know, does something new, she likes to go to the library and get all the books on that topic. So she came back with a stack of, like, so you've decided to homeschool your kids' books. And... Uh, we found out that not very many of those are written uh, from the background of, so you've decided to homeschool your kids for one year and then put them right back into public school again. Uh, a lot of them were like, hey, you know, you want more religious education in your kids' education. Your schools aren't that great where you live. Uh, you have a big family and you want to spend more time together or you're trying to help your kids get a leg up educationally or whatever. All of them assumed that you were going to be doing this for multiple years. A lot of them say things like, uh, Hey, if you don't get it right your first year, don't worry about it. You'll figure it out as you go. And uh, you know, we read those things and said, okay, that doesn't really help us very much. So actually, the most useful thing for us ended up being our public school, the one that we were taking the kids out of, along with the state funding that went with them, right? <laughs> our public school was, and the, all the staff and administrators there were absolutely phenomenal. They gave us 
curriculum. They gave us outlines of what they cover in their class. Basically, they gave us all the stuff that they've you know, developed over their careers, all the hard work. They even offered us uh, teacher's editions of books to borrow for the year. And so we basically followed our public school's curriculum because we knew it's going to go right from this school right back to the school a year later. Uh, so you know, why try and do anything different? And that actually worked fairly well. Uh, we actually had one teacher tell us beforehand off the record that if we didn't do anything but give the kids the great experiences that they'd have from this trip, uh, that they'd probably be OK. And then she paused for a second and said, off the record. <laughs> Don't tell my boss, right? Uh, one of the th so coming back to work for a minute, one of the things that you have to think about when you're working remotely uh, for a company that's kind of all over the country or world is time zones. Any of you guys who uh, raised your hands earlier and said you work remotely work for companies or clients that are in different time zones around the US or world? So you guys know, you'll know what I mean when I say that you get into sort of the habit of putting EST or EDT or whatever after the, all the times that you put in your emails, hey, are you, I'm available from 1 to 3 EDT. Or I learned that I would just learn where all my clients or all my friends or coworkers were. And I would learn what time zone to convert it to. And I would put it in their time zone to save them that extra step. Uh, for some reason, I found that even though I had you know, 100 clients over the years to keep track of where they lived, and they only had one of me to keep track of, that they had a really hard time remembering that Michigan was an eastern time zone. So, uh, so I would just convert it for them into their time zone. Uh, but on the trip, I, I kind of realized as we were just kind of walking out the door, actually, that, hey, I'm going to be in eastern time zone today, and then I'm going to be in central time zone tomorrow. I'll be in that time zone for a few weeks, and then I'll be in mountain time zone. I might work for somebody one in one time zone on Friday and a different time zone on Monday, this is going to be really confusing for my clients who are the ones who are trying to convert things for me to, to my time zone. Uh, if I'm working different hours all the time, it's totally unpredictable. So what I decided to do was actually all the way up to and including mountain time, I worked eastern time zone. And then in Pacific time zone, I just could not bring myself to start working at 5 AM. Uh, it was not good for anybody if I tried to do that. Uh, I'm a night person anyway, so that was just too, too extreme in the Pacific time zone. And I ended up switching to Pacific while we were out there and then uh, reversing back when we got back to Central. But what was great about that, especially that first summer, you know, the sun is up until 9, 10 p.m. And you can, uh, <clears throat> you know, I could work until like maybe 3 in the afternoon, 2 in the afternoon some days. And then my, f my kids and my wife and I could jump in the truck and go see a national park for six or eight hours. And it felt like a whole day of exploring that we got after, after work day. So that was a pretty cool thing. One of the really difficult things working in an RV, a 400 square foot of living space RV with two kids and your wife <laughs> is quiet. Because I'm on, meeting, you know, I'm on meetings six to eight plus hours a day, uh, you know, trying to keep the lid on the kids all the time was a little difficult. So let me show you the floor plan for our RV. You saw the picture of it earlier. This is called a bunkhouse style fifth wheel. The reason it's called that is because this room in the back here, you can see there's a door that separates it from the rest. This is the very back of the RV. And this has two bunk uh, bays here. And that's why it's called a bunkhouse. So this is the kids' room. Uh, under this bed here, we actually had a custom table and, and benches put in uh, so that this could be like a workspace under this bed for the kids when they were doing school. And then we've got sort of the dining room, living room, kitchen, great room area here. And then up the steps, now getting up higher over the truck bed when it's hooked up, we've got our bathroom. And then this is the master here. Just to give you a sense of scale, this space right here, I could walk through sideways. This space right here, I had to shuffle through this way. And my knees were bumping in the back and front the whole time. So not a big space. Uh, this is a little built-in dresser here. It was about. Uh, maybe knee height that it came up to for me. And so this basically became my office for the year. And you may be wondering about, well, what about, you know, what about the co-working spaces or the coffee shops or those types of options? Well, let me tell you about that. There's sort of a coffee shop fallacy. Anybody tried working in a coffee shop before? Raise hands. Anybody found it distracting or loud or, yeah? 
So you guys know where I'm at. And then I'm guessing you've probably already run into the problem that I ran into, which is that the internet is completely unpredictable. In fact, you could go to the coffee shop on Monday and the same one on Tuesday and have totally different internet experiences. And I just, my clients, you know, I didn't want them to have to be patient with me disappearing in the middle of meetings and things like that. And so because of that, uh, it just, I didn't have control over that situation. When it's my kids being loud, I can say, hey guys, be quiet. When it's the barista being loud, it's a little harder, you know. I tried, they didn't like it when I told them to be quiet. Uh, so the other problem with the coffee shops is finding them, finding the good ones, the quiet one with a quiet spot and good internet. We'd be in a place typically two to four weeks. By the time I found a place that I liked, we'd be moving on to the next place and I'd have to start all over again. I'd get maybe one good day there. And so I worked a lot in my mobile office, uh, which is to say this bedroom here. And then the kids would do a lot of their school during the school day here. Uh, let's see. All right, so I told you I'd talk about internet, so now we'll get a little nerdier here and talk about how I had internet access. So I'm kind of a planner, and I like to, to measure and think ahead and, and stuff like this. And so because of that, about maybe six months before the trip, when I started really obsessing about how am I going to make sure I have internet access, I started measuring how much internet I used on a typical day. Uh, anybody have any guesses? Let's say in gigabytes for how much I was using on average. A lot, a lot is a good guess. Uh, four. <laughs> four is a good guess. So on average, a work day, I was using two gigabytes a day. So anybody who's got a, uh, you know, like a 10 gigabyte plan that you share with your whole family, right, on your cell phone is already doing the math and thinking, holy cow, that is a lot of money. Uh, for internet, and yes, that is true. I probably spent two or three times my normal internet budget at home on the trip this year with some of this equipment, uh, but it was to guarantee that I would always have options even if a piece of equipment stopped working. Um, I also got a laptop stand that really helped out a lot, uh, a battery, a MiFi device, which we'll talk about in a second, and uh, something called a Wi-Fi Ranger, which I'll go into a little more detail on. So these are my two main internet access devices. This is an iPhone 5S, and this is a MiFi device, both on the Verizon footprint. So I'll talk about this in just a minute, too. Uh, I did a lot of research about the different cell networks and their 4G LTE footprints. And in the end, what I decided to do is get two Verizon footprint devices. This one was actually, initially when we left, it was through a company called Millenicom, and they basically bought bulk uh, packages of Verizon a bandwidth from Verizon and then resold it on their own brand for cheaper with basically worse customer service. <laughs> and uh, they actually got bought by Verizon during the trip and so that got rolled into a Verizon plan on me and I had two different Verizon accounts and uh, the price went up of course. But uh, it started out, it was 20, 20 gigabytes for $90 and then any time you went over you automatically bought another 20 gigabyte block for another $90. So expensive, certainly, uh, but reasonable, much more reasonable than just uh, the plans that they had at the time on Verizon. So I would typically be on my phone tethered all day. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's still using up the precious bandwidth. Yes, that is true, although I'm, this is, you guys are going to hate me after this. I'm one of those people who still has the grandfathered in Verizon Unlimited plans. I'm the reason that your plan is so expensive. Um, and so I actually, I could use this unlimited, so you may wonder, well, why have this one at all? And the reason is because I travel a lot for business, and if I was ever away from the RV, especially for an extended period of time, I wanted my wife and the kids to be able to have internet access as well. So that was kind of a, this one was always in the RV, and this one was always with me. Wi-Fi was always a nice way to, to get internet without having to use my expensive bandwidth all the time. And so that was always my first tier. I would always try for the, the Wi-Fi at the RV parks first. I'll tell you, as a rule, RV park Wi-Fi is awful. They all have it. They all advertise it. They all say how much they spent on it and how great it is. A lot of times you can get a really great signal, and then you know, you're connected to uh, like a dial-up behind that. And so it really doesn't matter how great the signal is, right? We, we're all technical enough to kind of know that you can't just have great Wi-Fi. You have to have great internet pipeline, too. 
So I got this device here to kind of help out with some of the problems. It's called a Wi-Fi Ranger. This router here would go inside the RV, and this router here would go outside the RV. This is the TV antenna on a typical RV. It's called a Batwing antenna, and it goes up and down. It goes down when you're traveling, and you crank it up when you stop. And this just attaches to the side, and then it's got a wire that goes down, and you drill a hole and seal that up and, and wire it right up to here with Ethernet. So basically what this does is it picks up Wi-Fi signals from hundreds of yards away and boosts them with this device outside. And then this right here repeats them and creates a new network inside your RV. The skin of an RV is often a, pr a pretty great blocker for radio signals. So this is a great way to get that RV or that Wi-Fi signal inside the RV. So I would say I probably use this about uh, maybe 10, 5, 10 percent of the time. Uh, but I could also hook up that MiFi device to this. And all of our devices in the RV could actually just attach to this guy's Wi-Fi signal. And whatever was behind that, whether it was the RV Park's Wi-Fi or my MiFi device plugged into it, uh, either way, they would all have internet access and we wouldn't have to be changing uh, wireless networks all the time. Another thing that really revolutionized I got uh, my work that I got during the year was this sort of adjustable laptop stand. Uh, so this is actually meant to be on your, uh, to, to be like on your lap if you're sitting in a bed using a laptop or on a couch. All of these joints adjust, and I told you about that dresser, that sort of knee-high dresser that I, I had in the, room, in the bedroom where I spent most of the time working. I could actually adjust all of these up and then set my laptop basically at stand-up desk height in front of me, and I, it gave me the option to have a stand-up desk, which is great. Uh, gave me a little bit of a little bit more flexibility in my working conditions than I had before that. So like I mentioned, I tried to start with Wi-Fi. It was pretty spotty. Uh, occasionally, the, it would work well, and I would be able to save some bandwidth and save some money. Uh, otherwise, I tried to use 4G tethered or with the MiFi device. Some apps that we found really helpful. Uh, the first one is called, uh, this one is called Coverage Map. This is an example of it on an iPad. Uh, it's Super cool. If you're going to go somewhere and you want to know if you're going to have good coverage for data there, you can actually get data. These are actually data points measured as measured by people who've actually been there on the network that you're interested in. So in this case, I've selected Verizon and the fastest speed found. So blue is, you know, darker blue it gets, the better it is. And the, the more red it gets, the, the more spotty it is. This is the island where Acadia National Park is and uh, Bar Harbor in Maine, sort of the uh, far extreme eastern edge of the continent here. And when we, when we picked our RV park here, it was one of the rare times that I forgot to look at this app before I did so. So we picked an RV park right here. And there was absolutely no signal. You can tell that it would have been a lot smarter to pick an RV park somewhere up here. Uh, but you can actually zoom in, and you can uh, you can tap on one of these hexagons and see how many uh, data points it represents and what kind of speeds that they got. This is a totally free app. Very highly recommend it. You can actually put in an address and, and find out how good the coverage is going to be there. Another one is called Coverage Question Mark. It's actually made by a tech nomadic family uh, that makes this app. And basically, all they've done is gone to the different carriers' websites and scraped all the data and combined it in a way where you can actually superimpose the, the different coverage maps over each other. Basically, the kind of comparison that most of them would prefer that you not do. Uh, so this right here is the AT&T network. So you can see this is pretty great, right? It covers a lot. It cover, doesn't cover some places out west, but hey, you know, a lot of those places are pretty empty. Here's the Verizon network. So the only reason some of these places aren't covered is they're the tops of mountains. Uh, much better coverage, and as you can see, I've got LTE selected here, so this is, uh, this is just that f top sp speed 4G. This one is Sprint, and then this one is T-Mobile, a little bit better than Sprint. So the only really other option besides Verizon for us was AT&T, and uh, I actually started looking in some of the specific places we were going to be, and as soon as you kind of went off the interstate, uh, Anywhere 30 minutes or even 30 minutes away from a national park, you were probably off the AT&T network. Uh, 
So what we found was that uh, AT&T was faster some places than Verizon was, but you just couldn't beat the Verizon footprint. So that's why we went with two of those devices. Some uh, moving day logistics. We found some great apps uh, that worked for this. I'm going to talk about in just a second. Uh, we would move Monday through Friday, tip, or we would stay put, I'm sorry, Monday through Friday because I was working which meant that we had to always move on Saturday or Sunday, which means our whole trip was kind of cut up into week intervals. Uh, we, if we were really interested in staying a place, we'd stay there four weeks. That would give us three full weekends in the middle to really explore the place and two moving weekends on either side. But what we really found is that there was a 1.5 multiplier about to what Google Maps said, how long it would take if I was driving my Civic like I did here today. Uh, it would probably pretty, be a pretty good guess what Google Maps says. When I'm driving a, a, a F-250 with a 15 or 16,000 pound RV behind me and going about 55 miles an hour and stopping for gas every about five minutes or so, <laughs> I can't go that fast. I can't make up that ground that fast. So if the day, if Google Maps says, oh, this is eight hours of driving, that's going to be 12 hours for us. And uh, we found that anything over eight was just too grueling. And so we would kind of broke the trip up into eight hour uh, increments. A um, few of the apps that I wanted to mention. Uh, this one is called iExit. I actually used this one on the way here. This is a super app. It's free if you want to check it out. Uh, the I in iExit, I believe, stands for interstate. It really works best on an interstate. So you're driving along an interstate, you know, and your significant other is in the other seat and says, uh, I have a hankering for Wendy's. So let's stop as soon as we see one of those blue signs that says Wendy's, right? You go past like 15 Taco Bells and several McDonald's and you still haven't seen a Wendy's and you're starting to wonder if you should get desperate and just go for McDonald's next time you see it or should hold out. There could just be a Wendy's around the corner, right? Well, iExit is perfect for that. You can actually see a list of the exits coming up and, all this, uh, and it actually detects automatically what road and what direction you're going uh, on if you're on an interstate. It tells you all the exits, it tells you how far to those exits, it tells you what types of services you can search. So we would often filter it by rest area because uh, McDonald's bathroom was a little hard for us to use on the trip because we were a total of about 50 feet long with the truck and the RV. So some McDonald's parking lots can't accommodate 50 feet of parking uh, or turning around either. So uh, rest stops were great because we could pull off and park in the truck area, that area you maybe never went into purposely before at the rest area. Uh, we could fit over there just fine and use the rest room and be back on the road in like five minutes. Uh, but you can actually filter it by service type as well. Um, another great one when you're going to a lot of different states all in rapid succession. Uh, so we had that, my, nine, my eight year old daughter who turned nine uh, on the trip and she was like right on the bubble in different states for whether she needed a booster seat or in some states, a seat belt. <laughs> but uh, there's, you wouldn't believe how many different laws there are that are not the same between different states that are all right next to each other. Uh, this screenshot here actually has the, uh, some of the alcohol stuff on it too. Uh, you know, there's some states, you've, I don't know what, I forget what Ohio is like, but uh, I know some states in the south if you want to buy alcohol, you can't do it at the grocery store. You have to go to a special store. Sometimes they're called ABC stores, right? So there's this one night. The kids were particularly difficult on my wife at school. She said, I'm in need of a wine cooler. I said, I will go get you a wine cooler because I'm a smart guy. And uh, I drove to the grocery store and walked around, and uh, I could not find the alcohol. So I finally asked somebody, and they're like, oh, we can't sell that here. And I'm thinking, oh, great, I'm going to have to go to another state. Uh, so, you know, they walked me through it. But we got, this, uh, we got this app, and this really helped out a lot. Some days we'd go through three or four states at a time all in one day, and knowing does my daughter need to have her booster seat, does she not need to have it, uh, you know, where can we get alcohol, for example. So just some quick stats to kind of summarize the trip. Uh, it's really hard to summarize something like this with so many experiences. I could talk about it for hours, but... Uh, I, I don't want you guys to miss the last session of the day. So uh, we visited all 48 states. We did accomplish our goal. 37 places that we lived in 34 different states. My wife actually did a really good job tabulating this stuff and uh, blogging about it on that website I showed you earlier too. 
uh, 74 different museums in one year. That sounds like hell for some of you probably, right? Uh, 28 national parks and monuments, 21 state parks, 17 military sites. If you add up all these different things, some of which I didn't even list here, uh, she, she came up with 187 different unique experiences in one year. Things that we would have never done if we hadn't gotten out on the road and done this. Most common category of question by far, the favorite category, what was your favorite place, what was your favorite state? So a few of those answers, if you're curious, favorite place for all four of us was Glacier National Park in Montana. Definitely recommend checking that out. Favorite state was kind of a tie between Oregon and California for different people in the family. Favorite surprise was Mardi Gras. We were in New Orleans by accident during Mardi Gras, I swear. And uh, I had seen you know, stuff on TV and the news and kind of thought, well, that's not family friendly. We're probably not going to be able to do anything there. Uh, come to find out that most of Mardi Gras is actually extremely family friendly. There's parades all day. Uh, my kids, we stood in about a three by three foot area. We saw for about six hours, saw three parades go by, hour and a half, two hours each. Uh, this is one of like 60 parades going on, 80 parades, something like that going on all over the city that day. In that little three by three foot area, my family caught 40 pounds of stuff thrown from the floats, the beads and the, and the doubloons they call them, and hats and stuffed animals and things for the kids. Uh, it was impossible not to leave with a smile on your face after a day like that. It was a pretty cool experience. Um, so favorite museums and RV parks there and a whole bunch of other experiences that I'd be happy to tell you about afterwards. Uh, so lessons learned. Not everything is a good day. This, whole, this one's got a long story behind it. If you'd like to hear that, let me know. Uh, usually there's not supposed to be basketball-sized bubbles in your sidewalls. So some lessons that we learned on the trip. More stuff equals more problems. There's a famous rap lyric about this, right? Uh, our national parks are, parks are absolutely exceptional. If you haven't taken advantage of them, I highly recommend it. There's an annual pass you can get for your whole family for $80 a year and go basically unlimited to national parks. I know there's a number of those uh, sites here in Ohio. Uh, people are the same everywhere, that, that tire situation. Uh, I have a whole story about that I could tell you. Uh, we were in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia in the hills, and I was real nervous about what kind of help we would be able to get, and uh, people were absolutely fantastic. Terroir, it's a, it's a French word you may have heard before. It means the earth or the ground. But it's also kind of come to mean the taste or flavor of a place. So you know, if you grow grapes in a certain location, they'll pick up the, the different you know, alkalines in the soil. And if, they're, if it's near the ocean, it might be a little saltier flavor uh, from the wine that's made from it. And so terroir has kind of evolved to mean the flavor of a place. And what we kind of learned on this trip is that you can go to a place, fly into the airport, take a taxi, an Uber, or whatever, go to a, to, to a uh, hotel, go to the strip mall, never actually taste the place, never really experience the place, even though you're there. Uh, taking some risks, this whole thing felt like a huge risk for us and all the rewards we got out of that. Most important thing, maybe, rule of anecdotal value. I heard this on a podcast that I enjoy listening to. The, the host of the podcast said that he tried to make decisions, when he was trying to, whether, to decide whether to do something or not do something in his life, he would ask himself the question, well, which would make a better story? Uh, so, you know, if it's uh, running out in front of the train, I would say probably, you know, there's some other rules that you should apply there, too. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times if you're trying, if you're like inside the box or maybe the scarier thing outside the box, the rule of anecdotal value could be a helpful rule for you. Flexibility and low expectations. You're a lot happier if you have low expectations because sometimes this happens, you know. Uh, being a local tourist, uh, there was days when on the trip where we would go three hours one direction on Saturday, come home and sleep, and go three hours uh, the other direction the next day. And uh, what we realized was that, uh, like where we live in Grand Rapids, we're about that distance from Detroit and Chicago, uh, in either opposite direction. We're like, we would never go to Chicago for one thing on Saturday and then go to Detroit the next day for one thing on Sunday. Uh, that seems crazy, but when you're in these places and you're like, well, this is our only chance to see these things, uh, you feel like, well, I, you know, I can't take this for granted and, uh, and miss this opportunity. And we real, realized that uh, when you live in a place, you kind of do take it for granted and you do miss a lot of opportunities. And so trying to be better local tourists. Uh, we also learned on the negative side, like the, uh, the tire thing, uh, we learned that RVs are kind of built like crap. Anybody else own an RV in the room? 
You feel, you feel what I'm saying there? Uh, they're, they're built uh, sort of a commodity, right? They, they la if you live in them full time, they last about five or six years. So it's a, definitely a depreciating asset. Uh, but we also learned that RV dealers are just the worst. I don't know what they're like in Ohio, but all the ones we dealt with were just very difficult. Uh, some of my least favorite stories from the trip were at RV dealers. Also learned that the west is the best. You know, we, I showed you that route. We did the west, and then we did the east. And, uh, you know, no offense, I'm from the east too, but uh, once you've seen the stuff out west, that sets the bar pretty high, and it's a little hard to meet that in the east part of the country. Everything is just so big and vast, uh, like this picture you see here in the background from uh, Glacier National Park. A few thoughts to leave you with before I let you go. A uh, quote from Henry David Thoreau in one of my favorite books, Walden. He says, pray, what do we move ever, uh, what do we move ever but to get rid of our furniture, right? Uh, my, one of my wife's favorite authors, Jill Briscoe, uh, said to her once, uh, I must have things, but things must not have me. I feel like these were things that we really learned on this trip uh, in a very visceral way. Another one uh, from, uh, on this picture of Yosemite here, which is just a beautiful place if you get a chance to visit there. John Muir, who did a lot to actually protect Yosemite, said about it that everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul alike. Uh, I think, you know, I found that to be very true. I think with our devices and our Wi-Fi and, uh, you know, how many people have kids who can't stand being off of the Wi-Fi for more than five minutes, and now they have Wi-Fi in cars, right? And... Uh, we really forced our kids to be off the grid a lot of times this past year, and of course they complained plenty about it, but what they also got was this, which I think is a deeper uh, need for our souls. And then last, uh, hopefully as a way to kind of inspire you as you're thinking about uh, your own adventures, uh, this, uh, this guy, uh, W.H. Murray here, who wrote uh, about a, a climb of uh, Himalayan, one of the Himalayan mountains, said, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. But the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves in. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issue from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen Incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamt would come his way. So this one always gets me because uh, there was a lot of times this year, this, on this trip uh, last year when we felt like uh, we were far, far away from the material assistance that we needed, and then something would happen. There's a lot of good people out there, and I, I believe this is really true. So, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I also do software development, so if you're interested in talking about that, this is me. Uh, I'll have those slides up on my GitHub account. Uh, I do already, actually, if you want to see any of this again, uh, but feel free to contact or come on down and uh, chat afterwards, and uh, don't forget to go to this bit.ly link. Uh, it doesn't look like anyone has yet, or either that or I lost my internet connection, but uh, if you guys do $75 before midnight tonight, I'll match that as well. So, thanks for coming today. I appreciate it.